Thank you, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to come to Paris, and it's uh, especially a pleasure to come to this institute, which uh, has such a long uh, history. Uh, this is a, a, a summary of work that um, I've done over, uh, I guess now, uh, 10 years since the word optical rogue wave first appeared in the literature. And before doing any of that, I'd just like to thank all the students and postdocs and so on and colleagues with whom I've worked over the years because without them, none of this would be possible. You may have seen on the first slide, there's a Twitter handle here. And I, I love Twitter and I understand Sylvain uh, uh, Gigant also likes Twitter. Uh, and you learn all sorts of things on Twitter. So you learn, for example, that there are different kinds of physics seminar. And on the y-axis, there's understanding, and here is time over about an hour. So this is a typical seminar, all right? Uh, this is an unprepared theorist where you understand <laughs> nothing. Right? This is an unprepared experimentalist, which occasionally is understandable because you may show a photograph of your equipment or, or something <laughs> like this. Uh, this is Richard Feynman, where you start off understanding nothing, and then at the end, you think you understand everything. This is a Nobel laureate where you go to learn and then it becomes impossible. And this is the ideal. So we, we, we'll see how you can, you can decide at the end how I do. I'm going to try for, for this and maybe a bit of this. So let's see. So th the motivation of, of this whole field is to try to understand uh, the physics of oceanographic large waves that appear unexpectedly on the ocean. And this is just some pictures that you see. Uh, there have been many anecdotes over centuries about giant waves and, and so on. And we're not talking about storm waves, which can in principle be forecast and, prepare, and you can avoid. Well, but we're talking about large waves that appear uh, in a sea where you would not expect one. And that's what makes them so dangerous, because you don't orient your boat in the right position, you don't prepare, and so on. Now, these rogue waves are, uh, are, are very destructive. These are some uh, photographs that uh, appear in, in the books and the talks on the subject that show the kind of power that can be contained in a large mass of water. And there's also a very human, uh, there's also a very real human cost. Uh, in commercial shipping, there's, off, there's typically about 400 fatalities per year and many of these are attributed to unknown causes, unknown causes uh, including so-called rogue waves. So uh, there's, there's a clear interest both from uh, the, physics, uh, the physics community, but also the shipping industry, the insurance companies, and so on, to try to understand in some way, can you predict sea states that may favor the emergence of uh, unexpectedly large waves on the ocean. Now for many years, no one really believed that the ocean could generate uh, unexpectedly large waves. I, th I guess people thought that this was just a standard exaggeration of sailors. Fishermen often exaggerate the size of their fish, and I guess sailors exaggerate the size of their waves. And uh, uh, so no one really took the field that seriously uh, until 1995 on New Year's Day, where on the Dropner oil platform in the North Sea, this wave record was measured. Now, the, these waves have a period of, of a, uh, uh, maybe uh, 10 seconds or so, so they have a, a wavelength of 200 metres. But the average excursion of the sea surface is plus or minus 5 metres. Okay. So now five meters, I guess, is about the height of the, 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 uh, the ceiling here. So the, the, the sea state is going up and down five meters with a 200 meter wavelength. It's still quite a, a large sea. And then all of a sudden, you end up with a peak here, which goes down five meters, but then it goes up about 18 meters. So you have a, all of a sudden, at this point, you have a wave which is uh, three times larger than, than what we were having over here. And that's obviously uh, unexpected, and it's also obviously quite dangerous. Uh, and over, over, this observation gave a, a, 
a credibility, some reality to these rogue waves on the ocean. And studies were then made on a statistical basis of uh, how these waves would appear in a probability distribution if you did a histogram of the wave heights. And it was found that the, these waves would manifest in the very long tail of a, a very asymmetric distribution. So this distribution here is essentially a Rayleigh distribution for the experts in the field. And it has a long tail, but these rogue waves would be way over here. Okay? So we, we would know approximately how they would appear if we could measure them. And it's this observation in optics that of a very long-tailed histogram in the intensity fluctuations in light coming out of an optical fibre that motivated this nature paper uh, to use the title optical rogue waves. So what they measured was they measured fluctuations in the intensity of some light coming out of a fibre with a nonlinear process. They found a time series that contained some fluctuations. They measured a histogram. They found a very long tail. And they drew a correspondence with the rogue waves on the ocean. And this uh, was met very sceptically in the beginning. And I was very sceptical about this whole uh, analogy. But I I've managed to now uh, uh, convince myself and I think confirm uh, quite rigorously that it's a, it's, it's a valid analogy. And this paper has had a very high impact in the field with over a thousand citations in, in 10 years, which has opened up many different avenues of, of research. Now, uh, just to define in some sense what we mean rogue, and I'm not going to go through this uh, in, in any more detail uh, in the statistics than this, but it gives a nice idea that if you have any distribution of, of waves or some measure of, of anything, it can be uh, amplitude of a wave on the ocean, intensity of a, of a pulse coming out of an optical fibre, then irrespective of the distribution, you can calculate the mean of the upper third of all the wave heights. Okay, so you can take the distribution, get the upper, uh, the upper, quarter, the upper um, third percentile, I've um, forgotten the English word, uh, of the um, distribution, calculate the mean of that upper third, multiply it by two, and if your wave is bigger than that, it's a rogue wave. So that's the definition. And interestingly, th this definition of the significant wave height was invented by a physicist called Wal Walter Monk, who turned 100 a few months ago. He's still alive. And he, he uh, made this definition in uh, in preparation for the uh, Allied landings in World War II. Fascinating history, because they needed a measure to forecast sea states, and none existed in 1943 when they first did the, the studies. And that's a fascinating uh, article about the history of uh, Walter Monk's life and so forth. Now, what we really need to explain, if we're going to try to explain uh, rogue waves, is what's the underlying mechanism? Uh, what can cause a wave to get bigger than uh, you might expect? Now, there are two processes that can determine the dynamics of any physical system. There's linear uh, uh, propagation and there's nonlinear propagation. And luckily, we have beautiful books like that by Witten, uh, which describes both. And so what we have to ask ourselves is, uh, are the dynamics of these rogue waves governed by linear effects, such as linear interference of multiple waves, or is there some kind of nonlinear localization that takes place that somehow focuses the energy in a nonlinear fashion? So this is what we have to answer. And so to do so, I'm going to go through uh, at least four of these uh, uh, keywords. We'll see how we go. Uh, I'm going to start talking about solitons and then look at uh, in a bit more detail about how random solitons can appear and how they can be interpreted as rogue waves. So I'm going to go right back into history to start with and uh, look at how uh, the concept of nonlinear localization began. Now, uh, in, in the 1830s, uh, communications were the same thing as transportation. If you wanted to transmit information between two points, you had to write a letter and you had to put it in an envelope and put the envelope in a bag and put the bag on a horse or in a boat and physically transport it from A to B. 
Okay? There was no telegraph, no wireless, no nothing like that. And canals in Scotland were a very uh, important part of that, uh, uh, that tra transportation mechanism. And an empirical observation was made that if the horses were, if the horses that pulled the barge were just trotting along slowly, the barge would sit down in the water and essentially create resistance behind it. So it would just sit like this. And anyone who's tried to pull a, a rowing boat knows what I'm talking about when you try to pull a boat to shore. But if the horses were made to gallop a little, faster than five miles an hour, the boat would sit upon its own wave and it would travel seemingly without resistance and it would allow the boat to go faster. And this was an observation that allowed the, the development of an industry in Scotland to create fast uh, barges between the canals. Now, John Scott Russell was actually working on steam transportation at the same time, uh, along the same route. Uh, he was an engineer. Occasionally, he taught at uh, uh, Edinburgh. And he performed experiments to study this effect of this wave underneath the barge by uh, linking some horses over here via a pulley to a barge. And he, uh, would, the horses would go this way, the barge would go this way, and uh, he would uh, just study how the shape of the hull would determine the speed at which the, the ultimate speed at which the, the, the barge could uh, be uh, transported, in which, which, in which it would propagate on the canal. Now, one day when he was doing the experiment, a rope broke in the apparatus and it disconnected the horses from the, uh, from the barge. And what happened was that, and these are his words, the boat stopped because it was no longer connected to the horses, but the mass of water on which the boat was surfing, essentially, or sitting, kept on propagating along the canal for about uh, three kilometres. And he popped up on one of these horses and he followed it along the side of the canal. And he called this the happiest day of his life because he discovered something genuinely new. And if you ever visit Harriet Watt University near Edinburgh, you can visit the spot near where he observe, observed the solitary wave or the soliton. Now, to get an idea of the uh, effect that this may have, 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 have had on him, it's possible to uh, show a movie, and there may be some music even, if this will work. Okay, some music. So these are experiments in Dijon, in the University of, of Burgundy, the Institut Carnot, where a mass of water at one end of a wave tank is used to displace a, a shallow water soliton that just propagates and it doesn't disperse out as a linear wave would. And that, that observation fascinated uh, Russell for his whole life. Now, he could not understand it and many famous physicists couldn't understand it. George Green tried, but he couldn't because they tried to explain it using linear physics. And it took until the late 19th, the late 19th century by uh, uh, Boussinesque and, and Cortevec de Vries and the theory of nonlinear partial differential equations to understand why such a, uh, a, a pulse of, of, of uh, water could propagate as a solution to shallow water wave equations. And the, this observation was essentially filed away as a curiosity until the 1950s when it became possible to study nonlinear science and nonlinear differential equations through numerical solutions. And then later on, as I'll talk about, when it became possible to generate such solitons in other systems, namely light. Now, the, the paper, there's a little interesting uh, parenthesis here because the paper that, that, that first observed these solitons, although the effect wasn't called that at the time, was a paper published uh, by Fermi, Pasta and Ulam after Fermi's death. Uh, but there are three names on the paper, but at the bottom they thank Mary Singu for actually doing the coding of the problem. 
And there's an article by Terry Doxois about the history of this. And I don't know if you've seen this film, but if you haven't, you should. Because uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, uh, computing wasn't really considered a man's job. Men did theory and, and, and women were left to do the arduous, uh, uninteresting and unimportant task of actually writing uh, computer code. But it was essential, and if you've seen this film, it's nice to see how that, that, that uh, little episode of history has been corrected. And, and now, of course, we, we, we know that these contributions were far more important than they, uh, than, uh, they were appreciated at the time, and this paper should really have four names on it. In any case, if you haven't seen the movie, you really should, because it's fascinating. Now, also in the history, in the 1960s, in the 1950s, the, the maser was invented. In the 1960s, the laser was invented. And this, these inventions enabled the discovery of uh, solitons with light. And I'll talk about that uh, in, in, a, in, in, a, in a second. But I want to point this out because the date at which the laser was first observed, May 16th, has now been declared by UNESCO two weeks ago as the International Day of Light. So as well as having an International Year of Light, now more remarkably, we'll have an International Day. Now, Michael Berry was in Besançon last week, and he said, well, in 2015, there was an International Year. There'll be an International Day in 2018, so maybe in 2019, there'll be an hour of light and then a second of light and, and so on. But actually, this means every single year, one day, we have UNESCO recognition of the importance of optics, of science, or whatever we want, culture, anything to do with light. So, uh, that's really nice. The, the logo is kind of interesting. It combines the sustainable development goals of the UN together with the sun, and it looks a bit like that. So, so uh, uh, there's a nice event in, in UNESCO in, in Paris on the 16th of May next year, where uh, Claude Cohen-Tanuji, Kip Thorne, and others will be speaking. So you're all welcome. It's free admission. So save the date, 16th of May in the afternoon. There's a light show, and there's a free cocktail. Very important. So, now, the, uh, s it became possible to study solitons and nonlinear optics with light because it became possible to uh, create lasers that delivered short pulses of light. And the delivery of short pulses is, is a, is a, from a laser is essentially a linear process where you superpose the different cavity modes of uh, a laser. So any laser consists, well, most lasers, especially in the 1960s, consisted of a standing wave cavity with uh, different frequencies oscillating inside. And the superposition of these different frequencies, if the phases could be made to remain stable uh, with, uh, uh, with time, would result in a constructive uh, interference, giving you a pulse of light, when all the crests overlap periodically and nothing really in between. Now this process of, uh, of periodic behavior from oscillators that have different frequencies can be illustrated in a very nice way with a mechanical analogy. And I don't know if you've seen this, but I found this and I, I find it fascinating. So this is a, a, what's called a pendulum wave where you have a group of pendula uh, on a bar and by adjusting the lengths of the pendulum in a, uh, in a square root with a square root dependence such that the frequency spacing between adjacent pendula is constant, you can create a, uh, a very nice illustration of mode locking, in a sense, and the idea of how this can lead to a, a periodic... Uh, a, a periodic... Um, I won't say pulse, but a periodic structure. So the, the, all the pendula start off aligned at one side, and then as they propagate with different frequencies, they create a, a superposition which appears at some points chaotic, but from time to time you see some structure inside. And then as this <laughs> continues hypnotically, There you wouldn't think, you'd think it's random, 
but here it comes back. And if you can't sleep at night, this is great to, <laughs> to, to watch. But here, it reforms its initial pattern, and it comes back. And that's a beautiful example of, of a mechanical analogy, in loose terms, of a, of a Moglot laser. And then it would just carry on. And it's Philip Glass, the musician. And it's a great exercise for students to reproduce this effect in MATLAB. So it's a really nice, it's not trivial to do this. It teaches you a lot about MATLAB and some physics as well. So that creates uh, a series of, of, of short pulses. And it's these pulses that you can use to excite nonlinear effects. Now, also in the 1960s, the optical fiber was uh, developed that involved uh, a low loss optical waveguide where you could confine laser light over a long distance and also excite uh, uh, non nonlinear effects. And the optical fiber soliton, an optical equivalent of uh, Russell's water wave that propagated without distortion, was proposed in 1973 and first absor observed in 1980. So this is an optical pulse that was uh, injected into an optical fibre at high power such that it would propagate over hundreds of metres, thousands of metres, without changing its form. And this was kind of observed in experiments in, in very special cases. Uh, it was considered as a way of designing telecommunication systems. It was ultimately abandoned, but it did teach us how to manage nonlinearity. And it also taught us that some lasers could also produce solitons. And the pulsed lasers that, that are very common in, in, in uh, laboratories, and I've seen a couple here, uh, based on self modlock titanium sapphire, uh, they also are essentially soliton lasers. Now this is just a very s simple schematic of what a pulse looks like in a cavity. If you want to be a little bit more realistic, uh, the, the cavity contains a nonlinear element, which is the light focused into the gain medium or the crystal, and a dispersive element that compensates it. And it's the balance between the uh, nonlinear focusing and the dispersive defocusing that creates a stable soliton pulse that can exist and circulate inside this cavity. Now, for those of you who, who, are, who have heard about the operation of this particular laser before, you may know that there's a spatial self-focusing effect that is also taking place inside the gain medium, creating a so-called curl ends. And it's the combination of the spatial self-focusing together with a selective aperture that stabilizes the uh, the, the mode locking process by creating what we call an effective saturable absorber. Now, this is quite technical, but what's interesting about it for the, for the people who have used this laser is that it's an example of a system that contains a form of temporal soliton, but also a form of spatial soliton. So it's a, it's a doubly soliton laser. And, and most people don't appreciate just how, how rich this Modlock tie sapphire laser is. And we've got them in boxes, black boxes or gray boxes on optical tables in most labs. Now, what happens if you inject a pulse from one of these femtosecond titanium sapphire lasers into an optical fiber is that you, you can, under some circumstances, generate a white light uh, supercontinuum where all the frequencies of the rainbow plus frequencies in the ultraviolet and the, uh, and the infrared are generated. Now this paper, this photograph was taken in, in, in Finland and I think maybe laser safety isn't a strong priority in <laughs> Finland because even though he's got goggles on, it's still not what I'd call especially safe, but never mind. Now this, um, this uh, discovery of the supercontinuum in 1999-2000 had immediate impact and I can't go into the details of, 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 of why it did, but uh, suffice to say that uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the consequences of having a regular train of pulses from a mode lock laser 
is that in the frequency domain, you create a, a Dirac Fourier transform, a comb of, of discrete uh, optical frequencies spaced by the repetition rate of the pulse train in time. Now, in general, you don't know the absolute position of these frequencies because of the, the details of what goes on in the laser, the phase velocity is not the same as the, as the group velocity in the laser cavity. But uh, if you have a broadband, a broadband spectrum generated from the laser that spans an octave in frequency, that is from f to 2f, then you can uh, stabilise and uh, lock the position of these frequencies. And this may seem like a fairly insignificant thing to do, but it revolutionised the whole field of optical frequency metrology through the uh, uh, invention of the optical frequency comb, and that led to half the Nobel Prize to Hall and Hanch in 2005. And it's really quite subtle how this works, but uh, it was appreciated once the supercontinuum was generated that that could be uh, uh, an, an important application, and that's what motivated a great deal of interest into the supercontinuum, into its properties, and into its noise. Now, uh, the, 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 the physics of, uh, of pulse propagation inside an optical fibre that generates a continuum is dominated by two effects. You can neglect loss under many uh, cases. One is linear dispersion, which just means that different frequencies under the bandwidth of a pulse see different refractive indices and the pulse will spread out generally in, 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 in with propagation. And there's a non-linear phase modulation because a pulse creates a non-linear refractive index across itself in time as it propagates. The pulse intensity is so high that it will uh, create a non-linear refractive index, a lump in time that's dynamic, and that non-linear refractive index creates a nonlinear phase modulation that depends on the intensity, and that generates new frequencies. Frequency is a derivative of the phase. If you have a time-varying nonlinear phase, you create new frequencies. And if you write down all that physics in a slightly more complicated way and you include other effects that we don't need to talk about here, you, you, you create a generalised nonlinear Schrodinger equation, or NLS, NLSE, and uh, you can simulate this, and this allows you to simulate the propagation of a short pulse injected into 50 centimetres of optical fibre, and you can see there's a very complex splitting in time and a very complex generation of new frequencies, but uh, the essential point to note is that your initial narrow bandwidth pulse injected at z equals zero in the fibre is transformed into a spectrum that spans from about 600 nanometers out to about 1300 nanometers. And the structure in here is very interesting, but what matters more than that interest is the fact that the modeling agrees with experiment qualitatively and to some extent quantitatively. And for the specialists, you can explain this whole process in terms of different kinds of soliton dynamics, uh, the input pulse is a high order soliton, it splits up. Each of the solitons undergo perturbation. A process called dispersive wave generation uh, creates new components in the blue, in the blue, and uh, uh, Raman self frequency shift generates frequencies to the red. It's a bit of jargon, but for those who, who know what these words uh, may mean, that's a basic, uh, simple explanation of what the supercontinuum is all about. Now, What's interesting is that because people wanted to generate stable supercontinuum generation for the purposes of frequency metrology, we got interested in understanding why supercontinuum could be noisy. And from numerical simulations, it became quite obvious that sometimes even very low noise injected in the initial <laughs> conditions into this propagation equation could generate very different spectra. So these are five numerical solutions to this partial differential equation with identical uh, initial pulses going into the simulation, just quantum noise, a, a, a very empirical 
one photon per mode spectral density uh, quantum noise in the simulation, but it doesn't really matter what the noise source is or what its correlations are. It still leads to very different results. Now, what you may measure with a slow integrating spectrometer will look smooth, but this is just hiding a very messy process underneath it. And uh, this measuring this was not possible before 2007. And uh, the Nature paper that also predicted the rogue waves reported a technique that allowed us to measure spectral fluctuations in, in real time on a supercontinuum. And the way it works is actually very simple. It's based on far field diffraction and Fourier optics. The fact that the, uh, the far field diffraction pattern of a mask uh, gives you uh, an intensity profile equal to the square modulus of the Fourier transform of the mask. So this is standard Fourier uh, optics. And in fact, that result, even though it's called Fraunhofer diffraction, uh, it, the, fir the first full derivation of that was by Dufieu from Besançon uh, in the 1940s. So what we do uh, in uh, the way this works is that we don't want to measure a spatial spectrum we want to measure the spectrum of a time varying field. So we have to replace spatial propagation by its equivalent in time. And that is just dispersion. So if we take a pulse in time, okay, and we stretch it linearly through linear dispersion, then the pulse shape in time will change. And the shape of the pulse in time will match the spectrum in frequency. Now, these two things are reversed because this is wavelength and not frequency, okay? But the shape of the pulse in time becomes equal to the Fourier transform of the input condition in the same way that the, 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 the spatial spectrum is the Fourier transform of the uh, uh, top hat transmission function of a single slit. And this is something that we can measure in time because we can adjust the parameters of the dispersion to uh, give us a pulse of maybe a nanosecond or so in temporal duration that we can measure on an oscilloscope. And so this is a little movie that shows how this works. So these are laser pulses generating a noisy spectrum uh, at 20 megahertz. So each one of these peaks is 50 nanoseconds apart. And this is the, the, this is a pulse coming out of an optical fibre, a supercontinuum, and what, these are pulses in time that have been stretched, and I'm claiming that these are actually the spectrum of the pulse. So we use the math function of the oscilloscope, and we average this, and we plot it on a semi-logarithmic axis, and then we can compare this average spectrum with the optical spectrum measured using a, a diffraction grating spectrometer. And we can see that over two orders of magnitude, they look essentially identical. And so we're able to measure, in, if you looked at this spectrum here, you'd think it's a very nice spectrum, very stable, but in fact, this is hiding these enormous spectral fluctuations. So it's a real mess. But we can now measure this. And the, the 19, uh, the 2007 Nature paper measured fluctuations on the long wavelength edge of a supercontinuum spectrum. And uh, it was these fluctuations of these solitons that created this long tailed histogram. And it was, they then thought that these solitons could be the source of rogue waves on the ocean. But that was a bit too optimistic because, in fact, it's more complicated than this. Uh, well, first of all, you have to realise that it wasn't a totally crazy idea and that just because you have two histograms that look the same doesn't mean at all you have the same physics. But the, the equation, the wave propagation equation for waves on deep water is actually a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with a cubic nonlinearity in the same way that the light pulse uh, envelope equivalent is a nonlinear Schrodinger equation with a cubic nonlinearity. So uh, uh, a, a wave packet of, of uh, 
uh, a wave packet on the ocean. So you have some carrier waves modulated by an envelope of some sort. Okay? Or the, the envelope of optical carrier cycles. Both of these envelope functions can be described by a nonlinear Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. So, in a sense, the analogy between optics and water waves is rigorous. Now you may complain, well, the, the ocean is a lot more complicated than an optical fiber. But, and it's certainly true that ocean waves can be, uh, uh, can cross and you can have multi dimensional spatial effects. But you can also have cases like this, where long period envelope waves can appear and be very one dimensional. Okay? So the, the, it's not always the case that the waves on the ocean are, are, are two dimensional or three dimensional, two plus one. Okay? Uh, you can have cases where they're one dimensional, such that a one dimensional equation, like an optical fiber, can describe the physics. Uh, so maybe there's some hope to try to understand these ocean waves with an optical analogy. Now, uh, the, 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 these, these experiments that observed these um, uh, solitons over here uh, motivated additional numerical simulations to try and understand uh, what the physics of what the physics might be causing the solitons to, to display this, this fluctuation behavior. So uh, what you can do very easily with Monte Carlo simulations is generate thousands or tens of thousands of numerical results and then look numerically which simulations generate these rogue waves that spread out in frequency more than, than others. And uh, and try to understand something about wh where the noise may, may come from. So this picture here is a, a, is a simulation that just shows a broadband spectrum, okay? And it shows some peaks and some solitons in time. And this is how it starts off with a broad pulse that goes into an optical fiber. And you start to see this modulation appearing on the envelope and some very strongly localized pulses that appear, okay? Now, you can also do a simulation with same initial conditions, just different noise. It looks qualitatively very similar to start with, but then something happens around about here, and one of these pulses just takes off and propagates very differently with a very different trajectory, both in time and in frequency. And it's this rogue soliton here that would be detected by uh, the uh, filtering process on the long wavelength edge that was reported in this 2007 Nature paper. Now these rogue solitons exist in optics, but there isn't really an analogy in the, in the ocean for a stable deep water soliton that can propagate over such long distance and experience an effect that may cause it to, to, to separate from any others. The particular effect that causes this separation is, is inelastic collisions through the Raman effect, and there isn't really an effect in the ocean that's equivalent to this. So these are interesting from an optics perspective, but the probability, that, the likelihood that these rogue waves as first seen in 2007 in optics have an oceanic analogy is very low. On the other hand, what about down here? What's actually causing this? Because in this initial regime of propagation, before these more complicated effects occur, this is a regime where the nonlinear Schrodinger equation is valid in optics and in the ocean. So what happens there? Well, the, the, this, this brought us into the whole field of, of what causes instabilities in the first place. Now, when you, when you, look, at the, the, when you look at instabilities, you link with chaos, and you get, you get into the general field of extreme events that are, the, are like waves or droughts or earthquakes that have uh, defining features that are rare, hard to predict, and they have a lot of impact. And the unpredictability of these rogue waves has influenced our culture. Now, in, in, in France, you have the, the, the term force majeure, uh, 
in, in English and in many other languages, it's called an act of God. So it's something, it's divine will that causes a, a, an extreme event. Now, we have to do better than God. So we, we have to replace unpredictability by, by, uh, by something a bit better. And Poincaré gives us the, the basis of this. So the, the, the possibility for uh, a nonlinear system to be sensitively dependent on initial conditions such that you can have dramatically different outcomes from seemingly identical uh, inputs is the basis of chaos. It's the basis of all of nonlinear uh, uh, nonlinear physics, and people often attribute this as a 20th century discovery. But Poincaré had worked it out uh, before that. So we have to uh, get rid of God, and we have to replace God by the nonlinear Schrödinger equation. And this is Adam writing the nonlinear Schrödinger equation, which I think is, is is a good way of doing it. And the, the first, the initial cause of instability in the, uh, in the Poincaré sense is a process called modulation instability, or in oceanography, the Benjamin Fair instability, or in uh, plasma physics, the best fellow of Talanov instability, but it's the same thing. It just, uh, it, it's a fundamental nonlinear process that describes the exponential growth of a periodic perturbation on a plane wave solution to this equation. So this equation admits a continuous wave, a plane wave solution. And if you have a small perturbation on that equation, on that solution, certain frequencies will grow exponentially. They'll see exponential growth. And it's fascinating, there's no external pumping. It's a, the system itself the, the, the injected wave itself is its own pump. So the, the energy is sucked out from the background level of the wave and it's localised into peaks. And the temporal separation of these peaks is the frequency at which this, instabil this instability sees maximum gain. And you, you can work out using linear stability analysis, you can work out the frequency at which this gain occurs, uh, you can even use uh, inverse scattering theory, which is a very complicated mathematical uh, technique, to find analytic solutions to this and that describe the form of these temporally localised peaks with a closed form uh, equation, which is very interesting. And uh, you can design experiments that will uh, allow you to excite and to measure these uh, these solutions. So, this what this. If I go back, uh, if I go back, say I have to go right back here to make this a bit clear. Okay. So, if you look, <coughs> if you look, if you took a cross section of the, if you took a cross section of the optical field here, you'd see a series of peaks, and locally you can describe these peaks analytically by an equation similar to this. Now, in the first instance, what we did was we wanted to excite these deterministically. So we created the initial conditions, not with random noise on a continuous wave, but we calculated the frequency at which the instability would see maximum gain, and we put a very low amplitude sinusoidal perturbation on a continuous wave laser. So you, you take a continuous wave laser, you put a, a, an amplitude modulator, or you can take two lasers and you can beat them together to create a, a coherent beat signal. You inject this into an optical fibre and you will excite, you will see with distance this pulse compress, suck energy from the background and localise itself to create a, a very high intensity peak. And the intensity of the peak can be 10 times higher than the background. So you're really, uh, your low amplitude wave may have a very small perturbation, but through nonlinear amplification, you can create an enormous peak. And if you did this with a random distribution, you would end up with peaks that well satisfied this condition of 
of being a rogue wave in terms of twice the significant wave height. So we, we did this over many years with colleagues in Dijon to, to generate all sorts of different solutions, and they're all quite detailed. But what's really interesting is that for a couple of years, we've now been doing this in real time. So we've been uh, extending our measurements from performing real-time spectral studies using this dispersive Fourier transform technique, the equivalent to uh, a spatial uh, diffraction, by creating a temporal lens, by putting a temporal quadratic phase onto an optical pulse so that it would magnify in time while retaining the, the structure. So we could, take, we could take an input optical pulse as our object, impose a quadratic phase on it temporally, watch it propagate, and it would magnify, creating an image that was a replica of the object. And this allows us to measure a random optical field, a random uh, instability field, and compare the shape of these random pulses, uh, which is the, you can see a selection of 10 of these pulses are the faint gray lines, and you average them and you get the red line and the dashed line is the analytic solution with no free parameters at all. Everything is controlled in the experiment. So this led us to think that we actually understand rogue waves. And so uh, fashion being what it is, we wrote a paper in Nature Photonics because you can't be taken seriously these days if you do. And that's a different story because I think it's a terrible thing that we have to do this. But anyway, we got a soliton on the cover. So that was nice. But more, more interestingly, we were able to motivate uh, people who worked in wave tanks to try to excite these nonlinear amplification solutions uh, in, in, in a controlled environment to try to see how uh, a boat might react to them. And so that was quite, quite interesting to see how the, the hydrodynamics community were interested in, in the field. Now, in fact, you don't actually need nonlinearity, and this was something that we showed towards the end of the ERC project, uh, and, and that if you have s simple some linear effects can also generate statistics that satisfy this uh, rogue wave criterion. So one is simple uh, caustic focusing. So caustic is just the creation of a region of high intensity from a series of ray envelopes. It's a very well-known effect okay, that you see every time you have a glass of water or wine and light goes through it. And you can create a random phase pattern uh, and with a spatial light modulator, uh, reflect light off it and let it propagate. And you can, you can see intensities that, that look like this. So this is experimental, an optical field. It looks very much like an ocean with a big peak. So this you can see rogue waves using random focusing, and you can also see it using, uh, in the ocean, you can uh, study real world uh, measured rogue waves, and you can reverse engineer the physics of how they were generated by uh, solving the appropriate, much more complicated three-dimensional ocean wave equation and you can turn the nonlinearity on and off, and you can add in some other things and see if you can also explain where these waves came from. And in fact, you can. So whilst a nonlinear effect will certainly give you a large wave on the ocean, you can turn the nonlinear term off in the simulation and replace it by uh, waves crossing from different directions, a series of waves crossing from different directions, and that will also give you a uh, uh, a wave that satisfies the rogue wave uh, criterion. Now, uh, I'll just I'll skip over the the, uh, the the last two parts because they were a little bit too uh, technical, and I'll just uh, uh, make a few comments in, 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 in finishing to conclude the talk. So, uh, I guess there are just three three points here that if you study noise in optics. You can link that with hydrodynamics and the study of rogue waves. There, isn't a, there is a regime where there's a legitimate analogy, which is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, uh, although there are also regimes such as the soliton uh, 
and supercontinuum, which although was the field where rogue waves were first identified, doesn't really have an analogy. Uh, rogue waves on the ocean, as far as the consensus is, they can emerge from either linear or nonlinear effects. I don't think there's any reason to think that one or the other is always responsible. I think there's sometimes it's linear, sometimes it's nonlinear, and probably most of the time it's a little bit of both. Uh, and if you're doing nonlinear optics, I think real time measurement techniques are the future because the information, the extra information you, you get from being able to see instabilities in real time is, is, is amazing. And uh, don't forget the 16th of May next year. So thank you very much. I used to live in Hawaii and I would spend a lot of time sitting on my deck looking at waves coming in and seeing these beautiful, very monochromatic waves, very one dimensional and so on, showing these sets of waves that the surfers would all talk about, that they would sit out there and wait for a, a good set. And after a while, I realized that the, the fact that it's um, well collimated in direction was just telling me that the storm up near Alaska was small in size uh, and that I could understand. What I needed to understand was why it was monochromatic. And I believe that has a lot to do with the wind that comes along, which is driving the waves as they propagate. And then I think everything falls into place. But that wouldn't be, the, the effect of the following wind would not be included, I don't think, in your nonlinear Schrodinger equation. You're absolutely, okay, so you're absolutely right in that wind, wind would be a, a forcing term of some sort that isn't present in the equation. But uh, the, the waves that arrive, um, I mean, there are extensions to the nonlinear Schrodinger equation that, that, that are looking at the wind, uh, and they can, as you might expect, they can either enhance the nonlinearity or they can attenuate it depending on uh, the type of wind and if there are gusts of wind and so forth. Uh, but the waves that arrive on, on the shore are not, are not uh, really monochromatic if, depending on how they were generated, because if you have a broadband a uh, group of waves that is generated at a storm, they will disperse, sometimes over, over thousands of kilometers. And so the different frequencies will spread out, but they will arrive at different times. And that, you don't always see that, but sometimes I believe you can. That, that's right. If, I mean, if the storm is very localized in time, yes. then you could understand the monochromaticity just through the dispersion. But I looked into that, and I don't think they are that well localized yeah. in time. The storms last quite a long time, but they're quite concentrated in space, was my I, impression. I, I'm not really an oceanographer, so I feel <laughs> on very dangerous territory trying to talk about oceanography, because I'll get shot or drowned. I suppose. Okay. So you were explaining that the um, soliton kind of sucks in the energy from the background in order to build its own strength, right? Yeah. And, but then, if that's the case, where does the energy come from? Like, shouldn't you see a soliton among some small waves around it? Also. Can, can, can you repeat the last bit, please? Yes, well, no, just, hold, just hold the microphone closer. Okay. That um, if the soliton kind of sucks in the energy from around him? Yep. Shouldn't you see smaller waves around the soliton than without him? So if the soliton sucks in energy from the side, it should you see? Well, in, in fact, the, the, I'm not sure if this answers the question. Uh, if you look at the intensity profile of, of th this, this thing's called a peregrine soliton. So if you look at the intensity profile, then the, 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 uh, there, there's a, like a little bump on either side, and there's a hole on either side of this main peak. So it's not a simple structure of a bump on a background. and actually contains some substructure with some lobes on either side. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, I was thinking in the soliton, in the one you were, look, you were showing with the ocean data. Yeah. That I don't know. I was kind of expecting that around the solitons the waves would be smaller because they would have less energy. But it seems that the level is constant, and then there is a big wave. 
but maybe it's just non-relevant. Oh well, I mean the the the, the background energy here is the the. Okay, your I, I, okay. I see the the initial lump, right? I suppose you're asking about conservation of energy. Yes. Okay. The the initial lump that generated this, right, had a very long period, like this. Okay. So okay. it was a very very long, and then you're localizing it into something that's very short. So you have to compare the integrated energy over the small bump. It goes out a long way, right? With this peak that goes up here, okay. So that's where the 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 energy is concentrated from, right. okay. Energy is conserved always. Thank you. Uh, you. You were pointing out on the slide showing the origin of the rogue wave. I think you were pointing out the long wavelength, and uh, uh, which one? Um, the very first one. No, no. Uh, just before that, you you were discussing the the part of the spectrum at long wavelengths, and uh, at the same time we could see something similar going on at short wavelengths. So I wanted to ask what it was. Um, so was this a was this a super continuum spectrum? Here, here, here. Uh, here. Yeah, here, this one on the left. Uh, okay, over over here. What this is? Yeah. Aha! This is uh, fascinating. So uh, the question is, the the spectrum expands. So in, in, in wavelength here, and it expands in wavelength over here, and you've got this rogue thing over here, and you've got this thing over here. Now this, this process here is, uh, it's a, the, the jargon is a dispersive wave. It's dispersive wave generation. So what, what, you're, what you're doing, the soliton is providing a, uh, a kind of a, a trapping mechanism that causes a, what's the best way to describe this? That causes a frequency shift of wavelengths on this side to shorter wavelengths. So this soliton creates a, a, um, a very strong nonlinear refractive index of itself. Okay, so the group by, if you look at the dispersive curve of the, if you look at the dispersive curve of the optical fiber, you end up with situations where the group velocity on the extreme red and the extreme blue ends of the, con of the continuum are very close. So this means that p part of your blue light here that's generated, which looks a bit noisy, it will still create, still have a wave packet. This will sense a very strong soliton refractive index uh, perturbation. And that creates a, a phase, mo a nonlinear, a cross-phase modulation of the uh, phase of the blue part, such that it experiences a small frequency shift to shorter wavelengths. And as the soliton moves to longer and longer wavelengths through a, Ra through a Raman effect, this blue part moves to shorter and shorter wavelengths through this cross-phase modulation effect. And so these two things occur symmetrically. And I have one more last question, maybe. Uh, does the per peregrine soliton has a particular application uh, in nonlinear optics or for imaging? Or? The peregrine soliton. Yes, the peregrine soliton. So um, the peregrine soliton is this particular solution that is uh, here. Um, in nonlinear optics, does it have a real application? Um, it may do. And, and, and if you need to create a, a regular train of, of optical pulses uh, with, out of a small amplitude system um, in, in an optical fiber or a nonlinear Schrodinger equation system, then the peregrine soliton is a nice way of doing this. So you can make nice frequency combs uh, from, a, from peregrine soliton dynamics. The problem is that this was known uh, for 25 years before people realized that it had an analytic solution. So people had discovered this empirically uh, and they just called it multi-wave mixing to generate ultra-short pulse trains and they didn't have an analytic formalism to interpret it. So there are applications for it. Uh, are there any new applications? Probably not, but you never know. <laughs>